Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today in War Thunder it's time to have a look at some of the suggestions which were passed on to the developers for April 2019. Now once again I'd just like to thank Coke Spray for putting this list together. As you can see it has some aviation stuff, some ground forces stuff, and then some miscellaneous stuff. So hopefully in the future we get a few more helicopter things and also naval stuff, but it mainly seems to be based around planes and ground vehicles this time. So I'll split it up into three videos. You'll have the aviation video, Video, which is this one, the ground forces video, that'll be the next one, and then the miscellaneous stuff like the mechanics and the maps and things such as that regard. So, let's get started. The first one is, of course, talking about an expansion of the AD series of aircraft. This is from kev to go and he is making the argument for the A1E, the A1H, and the A1J Sky Raiders. Now, the Sky Raiders have always been annoying to me for one simple reason. The fact that they just decided to change their names halfway through development. This is why, as you can see, the A1H is also labeled the AD6, the A1J is labeled the AD7, and the A1E uh, labeled the AD5. As a child growing up reading about these things, I got incredibly confused why the AD4 came before the A1. I thought in my head that the A1 would have been the, you know, actual first <laughs> of the Sky Raider, but no, instead what happened is through development, uh, the Sky Raiders decided to redesignate their names. A lot of other aircraft have done the same thing for the Americans, such as the B-26 going into the A-26, and it's just annoying. It would have been much better <laughs> if, uh, you know, the names were actually kept. So, what is uh, the aircraft that are being talked about here? You know, the A-1E, the A-1H, and the A-1J. Well, we have the AD-4s and the AD-2s in-game. The the uh, A1E is the push forward from what would be known as the AD5. The AD5 was eventually redesignated uh, the A1E. And uh, to show that, uh, I can show you the uh, description here where it says in September 1962, the surviving AD5s were redesignated the A1E when used in the attack role and the UA1E when used in the utility role. So this would be a further expansion of the machines that we have in a uh, game right now. So uh, they would have the 420mm ANM3s that you used to and 15 external hard points uh, with a capacity of 8,000 pounds worth of bombs and also torpedoes, mine dispensers, unguided rockets and gun pods. The Americans were not messing around <laughs> with the Sky Raiders and even though uh, in the Vietnam War they were slowly but surely getting phased out, they still uh, were used in a massive capacity. They actually scored a few air kills, even though they were mainly designed for naval and ground attack. These uh, naval attackers uh, were supposed to be replaced by the A6A intruder as part of the general switch to jet aircraft, and a lot of these... Uh, a lot of these surviving A1s uh, were actually sent uh, to the South Vietnamese Air Force to be used by them after the A6As came into uh, came into the combat zone and were used. So, with that said, uh, one of the interesting stories is this one. During the war, the US Navy Sky Raiders, which were A1Hs at the time, shot down two North Vietnamese Air Force uh, Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-17 jet fighters. One on the 20th of June 1965, a victory shared by Lieutenant Clinton B. Johnson and Lieutenant Junior Grade Charles W. Hartman III of VA-25, and one on the 9th of October 1966 by, uh, uh, what would that be, Lieutenant J.G. William T. Patton of VA-176 using their cannons. Uh, this was the first gun kill of Vietnam. So the A1H, which is of course a Sky Raider, uh, actually has the historical significance of having the first air kill in Vietnam, even though these things were mainly used as taught about for ground attack. Now what would be the main reason for adding these machines in? Well obviously the historical significance of them being used in the Vietnam War, and also uh, being used from the late 1940s all the way up to the 1960s. It would also be a good expansion of what we already have in the game when it comes to the AD series of aircraft or the Sky Raiders and also 
when it comes to an armament point of view, even though the cannons are still the same, the uh, the bomb loads are completely different on these machines. They use much more modernized bombs. You can see here uh, the different style of bombs, which are very reminiscent of some of the larger bombs uh, that we actually have uh, in the uh, game right now. And the differences between the A1E, A1H, and A1J, where you can see the A1J here, uh, basically had a, a slightly more improved engine, it had a strengthened undercarriage and a more robust engine mounting. What they were actually trying to do with the AD5, it's kind of interesting. So, uh, with, uh, as, as I said, the A1, the, the A1E to the H to the J were just constant improvements of the design until, you know, it was eventually phased out. But the uh, A1E, uh, which is the AD5, or the, you know, surviving AD5, uh, this has a really cool interesting story. So the designation 85 was initially reserved for a proposed late 1948 version of the Sky Raider to be powered by a turbo compound version of the R3350 engine. Several other aircraft of the era were also being considered for such an engine, including the B-36 and the B-50. However, the turbo compound engine was so heavy and large that it would have required a major airframe redesign, and since the production run of the Sky Raider was thought to be nearing its end, the project was not proceeded with. The designation 85 was used instead for a December 1949 proposal for an aircraft which would combine the anti-submarine hunter-killer role in a single airframe and with side-by-side -side seating for two crew members. In order to accommodate the side-by-side -side seating, the aircraft was lengthened by 1 feet 11 inches and the upper fuselage was broadened. The dive brakes on the fuselage sides were deleted, but the ventral dive brake was, ret was uh, retained. Uh, improved and larger underwing bomb racks were installed, the leading edge of the underwing racks were moved further forward, their leading edges extending well forward in the wing leading edge. Provisions were made for a new and more sturdy centerline pylon, and the wing armament of 420mm was made standard. An air scoop was added to the leading edge of the vertical fin. So this thing, uh, if you actually had a look uh, at this picture up here, it may have kind of confused you, right? Because we're used to, with the AD4 in-game and the AD2, just a single person, right? Well, if you look here, this is the cockpit of an A1E or an AD5, and you can see you technically have two people here, uh, which uh, would at least be a general step up from, you know, what we had uh, before in the form of the AD4. It would at least make the cockpit a hell of a lot more interesting, and uh, all I can say is this would be an insane amount of work to create if uh, they were able to ever do it. But yeah, uh, by the time of the Vietnam War, it can definitely be said that the Sky Raider program uh, was uh, pretty much done. You know, it was, uh, it was even by the 60s, you know, it was obviously still serviceable, but if it came into a proper frontline combat zone, let's say against the Soviets or something like this, it definitely wouldn't have uh, fared too well. Uh, the A6A intruder, uh, the fact that it was being put into service at the time, shows that the Sky Raider had already passed its best. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't have these versions in game. I am an advocate for all of these different versions. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what BRs they should be, uh, but I would definitely be, you know, it would be great to see them. Uh, especially with the different style of rockets and bombs that will be on offer. The next one is a German Saber, because <laughs> the Germans already have two wonderful Sabres, why not give them another one? This is from Piev, or Piev and uh, he is making the argument for the F-86K. The F-86D, uh, which is the uh, American uh, version of the F-86K, I suppose you'd say. It's obviously it comes from the Americans, being a Sabre. Uh, it had an MG4 fire control system and four 20mm M24A1s, so you could actually see this as a uh, expansion into not just the German Sabres, but also into the American ones, because this Sabre has radar on it, and it also has the 420mm. For me, that sounds like a really wonderful pattern 
package. The difference between the F86D and the F86K is, well, even though the F86K is derived off of the F86D, it did have some slight differences. First of all, it's built by Italians, uh, so that's all you need to know. And the main difference between uh, the MG4 fire control system uh, it was uh, exchanged in place of the of the Hughes E4 system, which had four Mauser 20 millimeters, uh, which replaced the machine gun and rocket pod tray armament of the F86D. So instead of having the four 20 millimeters, uh, you would instead have four Mausers. So if you wanted the difference between the two aircraft in game, uh, you could easily, you know, make it, you know, uh, or at least uh, make it that to be, uh, or whatever you want to call it. And uh, as uh, I said before, even though this was built by the Italians, it was used by the Germans, and you can see that another difference, as it says, of the significance was the lengthening of the case fuselage in order to balance the center of gravity. So uh, they lengthened it slightly, and also they gave it different guns, and on top of this as well, it also, uh, in a field modification term, could also be, uh, it could have the extended wings of the F-40. If you know that a lot of, uh, well, I suppose you'd call them export sabers, did have extended, uh, well, sorry, they were converted to F-40, uh, Converted to F-40s is the wrong word, but you know how in-game we have the F-40 and the main advantage of it is the extended wings and uh, the fact that it has, you know, the extended span and the cord? Well, uh, a lot of sabers at that time were extended using uh, the F-40 wing in kind of a on-ground sense. Uh, so this F-86K could be much different to the F-86D that we could have in the American tree. It would, of course, be better <laughs> than it, and obviously this would annoy a lot of people, but as, uh, as you know, talking to a lot of my American compatriots, as they will tell you, the Sabre program was exported to everyone and, you know, uh, made or evolved by everyone because the Americans at the time were just working on much bigger and better things, the F-100 program being one of them. But one of the interesting things about this is that instead of just having the 20 millimeter guns, it also would have access to sidewinders, uh, therefore meaning that it could definitely be uh, one of those uh, machines that fits well in the 9397 bracket, which hopefully will become more and more popular since now we have some more Tenno vehicles. The next uh, vehicle is once again from Piev or Piev, and this is the Lavochkin LA7R. Now, I've done a decent amount of research into this plane because the Soviets went a little bit overboard when it came to motor jet engines, when it came to mixed propulsion engines, when it came to just trying to figure out you know, how to get an advantage in the rocket department when it came to propulsion. The Lavochkin LA-7R was one of those <laughs> machines where they tried to get uh, this advantage. What they did was they took an LA-7, uh, a test uh, bed, and uh, they installed an RD-1 in it, uh, which was one of the world's first liquid propellant rocket engines. So you had the propeller, uh, you had the main engine at the front, with obviously powered by the uh, engine and powering the propeller, and then you have in the booty a liquid propellant rocket engine. The designer was VP Glushko, and the thrust chamber was mounted on the framework of welded steel tubes carried behind a modified rear fuselage frame. This merged at the top into the uh, into the fin trailing edge, and to accommodate the rocket, the lower part of the rudder was removed. Uh, you can actually see it here, where uh, this part has been cut off, just so it can fire out the back. This is what the back of it looks like. This was a test engine, so probably uh, put in after woods and you can see that here is where the end of it is so this technically uh, at least in my opinion would be a mixed propulsion system you have the engine on the front then you have the rocket engine strapped to the back and uh, you would hopefully get a little bit more power after the ignition of the rocket the rocket itself carried 
concentrated red fuming nitric acid and also kerosene uh, so that was the main that was the main you know uh, explosion or well not explosion but energy uh, that was coming out of this machine uh, the uh, the fact that the engine itself was actually quite light i mean light is relative but 100 kilos or 215 kilos with the propellants and the water and uh, it had an electrical ignition and the later versions, such as the RD1 KHC, had an automatic chemical ignition from the hypergolic uh, liquids. So it was on and off. So the idea was you would uh, basically have a switch. If you wanted a bit more power, flick it. Let's go, baby. You know, let's go crazy. And then when you don't want it, you flick it off until obviously you run out of fuel. Now, what this post doesn't talk about uh, <laughs> is the uh, is the unfortunate end and the reason why this project never really went further than it was supposed to. And, uh, well, they tested it with a bunch of different ideas, right? If you look into Soviet aircraft design, you can't say that they didn't try during World War II to advance or evolve, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, aircraft uh, in general. But the main issue they ran into is they had a propensity to explode. And, <laughs> and there's no difference with the LA-7R. So the issue with adding a, uh, you know, a rocket engine to the back of your aircraft is the flight characteristics and qualities normally degrade. And therefore, that's exactly what happened with this machine. So it actually, it didn't become uncontrollable. It just became a lot worse to handle than the standard Levechkin 7, which was seen as not a bad aircraft to actually handle. Uh, there was 15 flights made in the first quarter of 1945, so we're talking about late war here, and on the 12th of May, on the ground, when they were testing uh, the rocket engine, it decided to explode. Uh, so it just went boom. Then uh, the aircraft was repaired, so they did want to try it again, and then in flights, uh, the pilots was able to, uh, or the pilots, uh, you know, it set off the rockets, and then bang! You know, <laughs> the plane just went up again. So, as you can see, uh, the rocket system had a few issues uh, from by itself. Just uh, exploding <laughs> and obviously creating a horrible scenario uh, for everybody involved. It kind of it reminds me of the VB-1002, where, you know, it, the engines themselves just really liked ripping themselves apart from overheating and, you know, just grinding themselves to death. Uh, this plane, unfortunately seems very similar uh, so even though it has you know a good max speed it has a good uh, altitude it has a good service ceiling it also is prone to blow up uh, so th that is a problem that many would have to face the next one is from uh, I believe it's Aquili Chrys uh, Chrysatos he's talking here about the Hawker Hunter F6, the day interceptor jet fighter, which was used alongside machines like the Javelin that we have in the game and the Supermarine Swift, which I hope eventually we get into game. The F6 Hunter is seen as the definitive style of Hunter. It is seen as the one which everybody knows, the one which was used the most, and the one which exceeded expectations compared to a lot of other British aircraft at the time, which weren't seen as good. The main characteristics of this machine is the fact that it is, as you can see, its wing design is different uh, compared to some of the other designs at the time. The uh, the English uh, or the British really liked the uh, leading edge idea, which I suppose a lot of people did at the time. I mean, it was a it was a very revolutionary idea, lovely to see. And also, they liked this idea of obviously multi-purpose aircraft, which is why the Hunter, even though it was seen as a day interceptor, could still carry an absolute crazy ton of um, you know armaments and munitions for different roles now one of the reasons why the f6 came around is because of the fact that they took all of the previous hunter ideas and uh, found out the strengths and weaknesses and built an aircraft which uh, put, which maximized the strengths and tried to minimize the weaknesses which is why it's seen as the definitive model some of the weaknesses shown from the early hunter prototypes was an in inadequate decent 
acceleration due to lack of an air brake on initial prototypes and Mark 1 models, the difficulties with pitch control at high angles of AOA, especially on later models with more powerful engines, the, the ejection of spent Aiden ammunition casing damaged the fuselage in flight and the low range operational radius due to insufficient internal fuel capacity. So they made sure to fix all of these issues and try their best uh, to push forward the idea of the Hunter, and it succeeded. It is seen as one of Britain's most iconic aircraft, which is why a lot of people want to see it in game, and all I can do is agree. Especially now that we have a lot of, uh, you know, supersonic aircraft, I definitely think for me... Uh, the Hunter F6 would slot very much into that 9.0 to 10.0 area. If you want its max speed, it's only 1150 uh, kilometers per hour. So we're not talking about a supersonic machine here, but what we are talking about is a very fun machine to use, which will have a lot of firepower behind it. Four Aiden 30 millimeters that you should be used to from many other jets, uh, <laughs> you know, of the time. I'd just like to thank B. Young, Blackie, Daniel Stanton, Dyslexic Child, Martinez, Matati, Moxie, Nito, Nick Graham, Alobrolo, and Super Cacti for supporting me on Patreon.